And welcome back to a Hannity special, Generation Zero. And tonight we're examining just how the financial crisis came about. Now, the documentary Generation Zero asserts that the financial crisis was actually a culture crisis. It suggests that by 2008, the ethos of personal responsibility had completely disappeared from American culture, and that put the entire financial system at risk. You look at the graph of the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average. There's actually a sharp corner where the where the graph goes up. That was the beginning of the dot-com bubble. Why did that happen in 1995? Why didn't it happen in 1985? Why didn't it happen in 2005? Why did it happen at all? The Depression-era generation uh, was retiring. This is a generation that understood uh, the dangers of financial risk. They had grown up in the economic deprivation of the Great Depression. The baby boomers that took over only knew the upside. They only knew about prosperity. So they took over Wall Street. They had the ambition. They had the hunger for profit. And they also realized something else. They realized that up to this point, the investment houses had been partnerships. You know, all the banks that blew themselves up, they were all publicly traded as Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers and Merrill Lynch and Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, they used to be partnerships, uh, and now they became publicly traded. When you were a partner at a Wall Street firm, you were a partner. Now that meant joint and several liability. You have complete and total liability for anything that happens. If one of your partners really screws up badly and loses billions of dollars, when you're sued, they go after the partner's assets, and that includes not just their stocks and their bonds and their bank accounts, but their houses and their cars and their boats and their Rolexes. There is no shield. Now, let me tell you, you know, other than, you know, telling your wife that, uh, you know, you've had an affair, I can't think of a more uncomfortable situation than going to the partners and saying, oh, by the way, boys, I lost you 50 or 100 million dollars, which each one of these guys are going to have to write a check out of the checking account. Not only would you be out on your ass, you'd be out of the business because you took a stupid, insane risk and you did it with other people's money who were sitting around the desk. The old guys in the basement with the green visors looking at the numbers, making sure that, hey, we're not going to take too much risk because I'm not going to lose my house. Everything was handled in a very fiscally prudent, very conservative basis. That's why when you look in the publicly traded companies, there is no liability on the people who made the decision. So you could wipe out the company, you could send it to zero, but these guys who paid themselves tens of millions of dollars, their houses are safe, their boats are safe, their cars are safe, their wealth is safe. It falls on the shareholders and the taxpayers. And back with me are the writer, director, and producer of the film, Steve Bannon, and the film's executive producer and president of Citizens United Productions, David Bossy. You know, I'm thinking of this as I'm watching this part in particular here. Small business goes belly up. They go bankrupt, and they usually lose a lot. And what you're saying here is that these Wall Street firms are protected. These big companies are protected. There's been a shift in the paradigm. Oh, certainly. I think, uh, and one of the things Steve brought th forward in this movie so well is just what we saw here. Uh, it, 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 in the old way it was done, you had to have personal responsibility. But this new generation, it, it seemed like the, the concept of personal responsibility was left in the mud at Woodstock, is, is right. kind of what we say. And that it really, they, they lost track of who they were, and it was all about me, the me generation. The investment banks are incredibly important in the post-war era as an integral part of e building the United States as an industrial power. Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, First Boston. These were partnerships with men that had fought in World War II and put their country first and had tremendous fiduciary responsibility. What you just described, Sean, is that we have, we have two systems in this country. We have socialism for the very poor, and we have socialism for the wealthy. We have capitalism for the middle class. It's and an interesting it, way. I've never really thought of it that it, way. It, it essentially is. And, and, the, and, the, and the bailouts, the, all the financial bailouts, Everything, the, the investment banking part of this meltdown is very important. But, but, and that's what people really don't really understand. And it, and it is a bailout of the financial elites. And it's but, really socialism. I, it's interesting you say this. Now, but, but, but it's interesting that the incestuous relationship which you go into in the film between the Democratic Party and big business. Because the impression, I think, of a lot of people, if you ask them, they're going to say, no, that's the Republican Party, you know, big business, you know, they're in their pockets, et cetera. 
Well, if you, yeah, I think if you look at that, I think Peter Schweitzer, yeah. who pointed that yeah. out so eloquently, is that the Democratic Party has truly uh, taken over that position of power on Wall Street. So, so I, 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 yeah. I don't want to get the Republican Party off the hook. It's really, it's it. really a party of incumbents. That political class mm -hmm. is their paymasters are the are, are, are the Wall is Wall Street. Right. And, 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 and by, by the way, 80 percent of those have come for, have come to the Democratic Party. So the Democratic Party has really shifted to what we call the Party of Davos to represent big financial interest. So uh, can I put it this way that basically these companies they offer big donations to political candidates of both parties mm -hmm. oftentimes and they get fringe benefits and part of the fringe benefits is that things go bad they get bailed out it's it's truly the party of incumbents. That's what this is all about. They want to support. It, it, look, the, the the corporations get hit up for donations uh, from the politicians, and the politicians come back and say, "What can we do?" So, for who's you? more corrupt? Is it the political system that's more corrupt? Because I believe oh. capitalism works. Oh. Capitalism is the answer. It clearly, they Capitol Hill the is jobs. the problem. Capitol Hill is the problem, not mm -hmm. Wall Street here. Well, I, I think an inextricably linked network between Capitol Hill and Wall Street. Let's take this for example. In the bailout, Sean, we've had two trillion dollars of bailout to financial firms. The bonus pool in 2006 was about 70 billion dollars for Wall Street firms on transactions that all went belly up and had to be bailed out in 2008. In 2009, the bonus pool is about 70 billion dollars. You've had the American taxpayer, the average middle class American, paying taxes to bail out these big firms, and there's been no change in behavior, no change in structure, no change in regulation. Why should they? Because they got the government there to help them. I mean, and there's no incentive, right? Where in the free market, there would be incentive. Yeah. All right, we got to take a crony, break. Crony capitalism. Coming up, does our trade deficit matter? Now, Generation Zero says it is putting us at risk. So what is the solution, and how do we stop outsourcing our wealth? Trade is critical to the mess that we are in. From after the Civil War to the 1960s, America was the world's foundry. We won World War II and World War I essentially by outproducing the Germans and the Japanese. Over the last 30 or 40 years, we've essentially deindustrialized America through a series of trade agreements.